Who, who considers themselves a developer or a technical person again? All right, so we're mostly technical. So that's great. How, how many of you have heard about Pong? More up 12, 3 percent. Check out the better. <laughs> I will present two case studies, both here in Singapore, and uh, one very small and one massive. So I'll talk about what we're doing with Kong here, and uh, some very interesting stuff, particularly for data, machine learning, and the financial markets. Uh, I'll hand up, John. Yeah, sure. Uh, 20 minutes, right? As long as you like. Okay, good. Hi, hi guys, I'm the founder CEO of Kong. So originally the company was called Mache, if you maybe some of you are familiar with the original name. We've been operating for seven years the largest API marketplace in the world. And so Kong recently we changed to Kong about a month ago. We rebranded the company to Kong. And also we sold the old asset of API marketplace to another company. So but we've been operating in the API space since 2009. And I'm traveling in Asia, in Tokyo, in Hong Kong, in Korea, and uh, also Singapore. So we're doing our Asian tour to, to meet potential customers and, and current customers before I go back to San Francisco. So I, I'm born in Rome. I grew up in Italy. Uh, at 21, I moved to, to Silicon Valley to start a company, Meshape, in uh, 2009. And then we raised, obviously, uh, funding and we grew the company and uh, I never go back to Italy at the end. And, uh, sometimes I miss good food, but... <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's start. So, the, the title is past, present, and future, but really we're going to talk uh, about uh, data market in general and where we see it evolving. Uh, we'll talk also about Kong, what it is, the company, and Kong open source, and also Kong Enterprise, which is the version for large organizations. Okay? So and feel free to ask me questions, feel free to, to stop me, and uh, if you get bored, you know, yell at me. So, first of all, I don't know, how many of you used to work with these technologies? Okay, and how many of you are still working with these technologies? Oh. <laughs> uh, so, so, so started, you know, in the early days it was Kipco, right? It was the message broker. Then you had VA system, you had uh, we Tuxedo, WebLogic, uh, you had minor competitors, you know, Tanity. Then you had, you know, Bluestock as an ESP players. Then you had API management, uh, I think 2009, 2016. And so in each, each of those, they kind of represent a different protocol coming in and out of the organization. And I think, you know, as we evolve, this thing always will evolve. But the concept of brokering information between services, they will always exist. So as a company, we want to focus on this uh, information that is in flight and add value to this to this corporation, to, to corporations. So, so remember, you know, it was pretty much heavyweight message brokers, ESB. Uh, REST, it really took off um, when Twitter published their APIs in 2008 as a public API platform. And it makes finally kind of like break the line, okay, now we're going on REST, and now we're going on REST. And then after that, it really got a, a big spark. That was before Twitter developed a platform, they screwed their stuff, but at that point, it was really, really good. Um, and then as we move forward to, you know, microservices thinking, you also have uh, RPC, like Google, Google RPC. How many of you use a gRPC or have heard of Google RPC? Only one? So, two? So Google RPC is built on top of HTTP2, binary protocol, uh, allows you very fast uh, uh, communications. And I think in the Microsoft architecture, you will hear more and more of Google RPC, not just REST. So this is, a, you know, evolving, it means also evolving architectures. So if you go all the way on the left, you have a website like eBay, which was 10 years ago. That was the only way to consume software, right? We built big 1.5 million lines of Java code running on a static server. Everything was static, nothing was moving. The consumer side was on your website, primarily interface. So you didn't have the need to have a dynamic software or a, a dynamic uh, demand. As you move, like you know, Steve Jobs goes on stage, 2008, launched the iPhone. After that, all the companies say, "Oh, we need to have a mobile strategy." I don't know if you remember, 2010, everything was mobile, mobile. Now nobody talk about mobile; everybody takes for granted. But back then, it was mobile, mobile, mobile. So here is like this intersection when finally. There has there already start to be different channels where families, employees, partner, customer consume software. It's not just the website. So you start to have mobile, you start to have iPads, tablets, and as you move your corporate platform, you start to have IoT, you know, Samsung fridge, Tesla cars. So it becomes way more dynamic, way, way more fragmented. As you move, now it's all about bots and messaging. You can hear all about virtual reality and AR, so new new data sets. 
And, and so the, the way we consume software is from one way to hundreds, right? As you go to AI, there will open up new device that will consume software. So the software response, it became very complicated. You know, it was first okay to have static Java, you know, bar file running there for 10 years. And then something happened here. It was a big inflection point. This is Google Trends. On microservices and API gateways. And it had a big spike of demand. People started to look for this. You know why there was a spike in 2014? If you get it, you get a t-shirt. <laughs> you know it. It is, right? I Call it. You want a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you want. So it's exactly around one year after Docker. Teacher for the right answer, teacher for courage. Good courage. <laughs> so, disruptor. Um, so, so uh, here is a year after Docker. And the Docker allows to, you know, the SOA dream of 2000 to start to be a reality by containers, all the applications. And so the trend microservices start to finally spike after them. And finally, this is the best thing we discover, is so API management as a technology, it was already here. Where a lot of vendors, like five, seven vendors here. But no one cares. They start to care as microservices goes up, and they don't they didn't even care about all the API management thing. What they didn't care is about API gateways, which was only the proxy piece. Why? And now we tell you why. So, why? Because, so in the past days the, of the eBay era, you had you know, static applications that had to be to go mobile. And the fastest way to go mobile in 2010 was to wrap up an API on top and save your tool every way in API management, monolithic, and then it was mainly public traffic. As the software gets the capital in a microservice architecture, the traffic moves from external to internal. Not only that, the, the velocity or the latency is start to matter. So here, if you had like latency through public traffic, it was fine. Once you go internal, each request count because had latency to your overall final applications result. So here speed is very important. Being distributed is very important. Being cloud, cloud agnostic, platform agnostic is very important. Here you were running on a server, probably a VM for 10 years. Here you go multi-cloud strategy. You run on containers, you use container orchestrator. There is a lot of different needs from there to here. But in this way, that's why the game will start to become mission critical. Before, it wasn't that much. It was something maybe done for, for the edge. Now, it's of course also the edge, but it's also in China. So there is a, a way stronger vision critical. And in a way, it still, is, it still looks a lot like going back to the typical ESP days, but this is like done right, right? So the, the, the main focus is internal traffic versus external, and distributed and platform agnostic uh, uh, solution. So this is what enterprise are doing, right? You are going from a big chicken the chicken McNuggets. <laughs> Why keeping the chicken alive? So this, this is where Global 5000 are now. Okay, we need to do microservices. You go and talk to everybody. Nobody knows how to start. Uh, they, they, they have a lot of different solutions on how to start the process. But reality is, um, there is so many technology out there, and they change so quickly, that it's very hard to pick the right one, right? Think about all the main, mainstream technology after containers. They did not exist five years ago. So there is, and, and in five years from now, who knows, you know, there, there will always be a fast evolving scenario. So most of the enterprise, you know, high level CEO, they are in this space, and they need to keep the chicken alive. So one of the solutions is the high school scoop strategy, which turn turned on the company. So the high school scoop strategy, this is your application, and you scoop out different function, or different part of the software, you move it to containers, and you start to move it out. Now the code is the API gateway, to keep, keep everything together. But this is one solution. There is also an atomic bomb strategy solution, which basically banks like CD banks are doing, where they start something from scratch. So a total R&D from scratch with the right technology. They don't try to, 
to spin up out technology from the monolithic, they just start everything from scratch. So we, we're gonna focus about the, the ice cream scoop strategy, which is a very uh, valuable for API gateways tonight. So let, let's get into the action. So this is how your application looks, right? You have your, your e-commerce app, it's a very simple way of describing application. You have a lot of services, islands, customer orders, you have a load balancer, and you have a client. So very simplistic e-commerce sample. You start with the couple. So you start to scoop out, you go into this Mac, chicken, chicken, and Mac strategy, you start to, to decouple all different services. And so you keep going, and also you need to have logic to grab those services. So you need a security, you need authentication, you need uh, rent limiting, you need logging, you need transformation. And so you start to have a lot of teams basically running data keys, but also running all this common logic. So you have a lot of code duplication. And at a massive organization, you might have 10,000 engineers, 7,000 are building the core API, and another 2,000 are just duplicating logic to run the API. So it's a very big uh, waste. So what Kong does for an API gateway? Allows you to take out all this code duplication and move into an abstraction layer. And then the abstraction layer, we run the right solution to the right service. So in the big order, you're going to save a lot of teams writing common logic and you just come takes, takes care of you. So this is like very uh, fundamental change in how to design software. If, when you were running monolithics, this one was only written one for the big monolithics. Now that you're running microservices, if you have a thousand one, this might be written a thousand times in many different languages. This can be Go, this can be Java, this can be Ruby, this can be another team, another part of the world in PHP. So, so it's even complex. Uh, this can be run on, on Kubernetes, this might run on VMware, this might run on, open, on OpenStack. So all this multiplication makes the need for an abstraction layer. And so all this uh, round that we did, that's why API gateways start to have a spy and they didn't have that need before. Any uh, questions in here? I've got a question. So you've got the old architecture being load balanced of fronting. Um, what's your best practice for resolving the front end of Kong? Are you doing um, some sort of DNS round robin? Yes. Okay. yes. So this is also some consistent way. You can have a lot of Kongs, yeah. and you put a, a nginx or you know WS load balancer and, and uh, yeah, there's a few ways to do that. And uh, I was just wondering what, what best yeah, practice. Yeah, round robin is. Oh no, I actually don't like round robin. I much rather stick a uh, load balancer up front, but. Um, you know, course of course, of course whatever, um, whatever approach I like is, is best, I guess, so. Yeah, consider that also Kong has no balance. Yeah, that's it. exactly right. So. For the, but for the upstream services. Yes. Right. Yeah. And service discovery to build in. Mm -hmm. So th this is another, I don't know if you can read it from part, but it's another way of, simplistic way of uh, uh, re-describing the process that we've gone through in the last five, six slides. Right here, you, you duplicate a lot of logic, and here you, you abstract the logic to a centralized gateway. How many of you use an API gateway in some shape or forms? One, two, three? So you are familiar with the approach your questions? Good. Okay. So we always say that running microservices is like running a city. Um, you know, you have firefighter, police, transportation, subway. So it's a lot of uh, uh, standard <coughs> of entities that needs to run together. So it also becomes very messy. I mean, think about the city of Singapore. You know, how many, how many, how many people live in? Or even, uh, I just came from Seoul with 12, 12 million Tokyo. So you can really see that as you run an enterprise on microservices, it's really like running a city. So a few words about Kong. So Kong uh, started uh, in 2015 as an open source project out of the API marketplace okay, that we were running. It was built on Nginx, it's still built on Nginx, and uh, has more than 4 million downloads, so I think now at this point we're about 5 or 6. So it definitely has a global adoption since, since in over 2 years. Um, it's extensible to plugins, so you can extend to over, over 35 plugins from us, and there's 100 plugins from the community. It's a sub millisecond latency, it's super fast. Uh, we script Nginx in Lua G, which is the fastest scripting language in the world. So that's why there's this combo of Nginx and Lua G, which is very weird, but it's the best uh, for performance. And as we go with microservices, you know, speed is the number one feature. You can be slow. It's also platform agnostic. You can run it everywhere, like you can run Nginx everywhere. 
Um, and also it's very fast and scalable in terms of like running it and turn it on in under five minutes and just launch a call, uh, and, you know, try to launch some uh, any way API module solution, it would take a couple of weeks. So there's also a big community. We have over 107 meetups around the world. There is 10,000 members. There is over now 80 eight contributors co contributing to, to the Kong uh, code base. Uh, about uh, 25 are from our company, and, um, and obviously it's the most popular on, on GitHub. So Kong active distances, this is a, actually it's a, it's a whole snapshot, but they do 27 times. So we have a phone home that you can disable. But for uh, the ones that do, they're not disabled, of them, firewall not counted out, you can see you know, the growth. This is for us, one of our KPI to understand how Kong is doing. Because downloads, it's a little bit of a vanity metric because you have bolts, you have CI, the pool is Kong, Docker Hub. So it's very easy to get big numbers. This is a key, key component. So you remember this one from my previous slide. This is how EPM Azure has been deployed for probably the last you know, five, five, seven years where you have a centralized abstraction layer, and that's the API gateway. Now, we also support in decentralized deployments, which are very good for Kubernetes deployment, you know, you know that can run Google Container Engine, AWS Container Engine. Uh, distributed, they are all pods, and so the, the real difference here is that Kong always had to pass the network request. Here, it's seen as a sidecar. And so by staying as a sidecar along the same microservice process, you cut the network latency, and you don't rely on the network that much like this solution. Here, you always have an extra hook in the network, and you know, we always say you can't trust the network, uh, but actually, you can get this run on networks. Here, you cut network latency quite far because Kong just run as a process into your microservices. So, this is a sidecar deployment, this is an API gateway deployment. Um, also, it's now taking Silicon Valley, is now called service mesh networks, but um, we are the only solution that can. They can uh, support sidecar deployments. Okay? So if you use Kubernetes and you have a lot of pods, this is probably the way to go for internal traffic, so east to west. And then if you have edge traffic, you can still have a Kong at the edge for client, for partners, but for team to team organization, you probably want to have a decentralized deployment. How many, how many of you use, uh, use Kubernetes? Or Mesosphere, or Docker Swarm? The Mesosphere is not very popular. Right? Not, not much. So, Kong authentication is an example of plugins that you can apply to, to your APIs with a pull request or with an admin GUI. Uh, you know, the most popular are obviously OAuth two point oh, JWT uh, for enterprise. OpenID is very it's very important, also very very complex. On top of this, you can always extend with custom plugins. So, those are the one that comes out of the box, but you can keep extending the platform through through custom plugins. Serverless, you know, how many of you use uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda? One? Yeah. You like it? It's good. You, you want to use uh, Java? You have Node. Node? Huh? Node. Node? Okay. So we think, so serverless is an interesting one. Serverless, it's, um, you know, in a way it's a treat to containers, because you don't need to care about containers orchestrator, container monitoring, container analytics, you just deploy a function into Lambda and you forget about it. Uh, but it's not for every use case. So it's more like for, you know, event-driven software, but for mission critical APs, I think they will still run on container for a lot of times I've had. Uh, but there is a lot of software also that is very good for serverless deployments. And so for us, it's very important to support all these different serverless platforms, right? So this is IBM open source, open with, there is also open fast, which we support as well. And we're going to have Google Cloud functions, uh, Azure functions. Uh, uh, so we would, we would support all the, all the, most of the major serverless platforms, so you can invoke all the function directly from Kong, but just turning on the plugin, put your AWS keys, and you are ready to go to add all the, all the goodies Kong has on your serverless infrastructure. So for example, in AWS, they have AWS API Gateway, they can chain on top of AWS Lambda, uh, but the AWS API Gateway you should, you know, has about 200 millisecond latency, uh, it's very limited in features, it's consumption based, you cannot extend that, it's not multi-cloud. Uh, Kong, the beauty is that you can always run anywhere, it's not consumption based because it's open source, uh, and also has a lot of way more features and, and it's faster and you can expand it. So that's why I think there's a lot of value in providing a, 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 a kind of like a Switzerland for, for API gateways that it doesn't have a specific cloud vendor, cloud vendor specific uh, solution. And obviously this is open source, but it's from IBM. An example of how you add a plugin to Com. You this is a, through this, you know, go through this LI through the pull command, this is an API. Of Kong, Kong has an admin API on top. 
you can you can post you know uh, uh, you know the ID of the APIs, the plugins. In this case, it's really limiting. You configure 10 requests per second, 50,000 requests per hour, and you you apply to the API that you want. You can apply to all the APIs in one specific set of APIs to a group of the APIs to consumers to single consumers to group of data consumers. It's very easy and it's programmable. On top of that, you also have custom plugins that you can always write and extend com and put more plugins in the life cycle of your request by writing your own uh, code and plugin to com so you can extend it over, over time with your own functionalities. Important, it's, uh, you know, we, we are fanatic about ubiquity, we're also fanatic about simple to use. So we have over 50 different ways to deploy. It's very, uh, I think, I think you know, it's, it's, it's very important for developers to just click what they want and get it up and running as soon as possible without thinking about it. So once you click one of those boxes, it's a snapshot of the website. You have one, two, three steps, and you're ready to go. The, the fastest is obviously, you know, AWS Cloud Formation, where you put your credential, and then you set up the region, and you automatically spin it up, come into your AWS region, configure with uh, with two or three gateway for, for high ability and the database run. Uh, also Google Cloud Platform, if you want to talk a little bit more later, you know, Google Cloud Launcher, click a bottom and set up come for you. But I, the most popular in terms of downloads or usage is that my Docker, so they can run it everywhere. So this is probably the number one usage, this is number two. Uh, also CentOS is very popular if you want to run a bare on a you know bare metal on operating system. And between you know Kubernetes is also the fastest growing between containers containers uh, orchestrators. And then we have source, where you want to download it from source and you want to edit your own, your own version of com. So that was the community edition at large. There is also an enterprise that we launched a month ago. Uh, enterprise is part of you know, our enterprise package as a com company. Uh, we have um, customer in, in across the world, different, different uh, verticals. So it's not just specific to finance or specific to e-commerce. It's pretty much global. And it's pretty much distributed in terms of geographic region, but also verticals. So there is, you know, cars manufacturers uh, for the IoT projects, media, hardware, security, like finance, uh, government agencies. So it's pretty much big and broad, which allows us to, to be valuable for a lot of different uh, folks. It's not specific on only one vertical. Obviously, we raised over $30 million from, from tier one investor in Silicon Valley. Uh, like Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, Eric Schmidt from Google. Uh, most of the money, we actually didn't want them. They just came in because Kong was growing so fast that we decided to accelerate uh, uh, the adoption and the enterprise development with more engineers and also which means also global coverage at the company level. So we have now uh, uh, folks all over the world for have a global coverage and both supports. And we'll, I will focus more on this later, but uh, we have a great, great success engineering team. So Kong Enterprise is divided by six major groups. The first group is uh, graphical interface. Kong community comes with uh, API and CLI. Kong Enterprise has an uh, enterprise group. There is also security parts, portal, analytics, uh, scalability, and also support and customer success. So those are like six areas that, that makes Kong community uh, better suited for large organizations. So the first one is admin GUI. It's built on top of Kong open source and allows you to manage Kong from a graphical interface. You can still use the API and the CLI for programmatically accessing the CLI, but also for easy to use and simplicity, you get a graphical interface as well. It's built, up, it's built in JavaScript. In, uh, I don't know how many of you use uh, Vue.js, which is a, a very good uh, recent JavaScript framework. And, and the beauty of it is that it's not a separate application or a separate software that you need to run and manage. It's, it's, it's shipped directly on port 8002. So it's served directly by Kong, and Kong de facto acts as a backend, and this is just front end uh, JavaScript code that reads from the admin API. So there's not separate code, there's no other you know, spaghetti pasta code all over the place. It's very simple and clean. Okay? And then port 8001 is actually the admin API. Security is, I think, is the, one of the major groups why people move to enterprise. Uh, Open ID Connect is very important for, for enterprise folks, LDAPs as well. So those are like commercial plugins that are available in the enterprise package. Open ID Connect, so that took us around four months to build the right Open ID. There are so many edge cases, so many variables, it's very complicated. If you have 
familiar with OpenID, you know it's uh, limitless. Uh, we support uh, most of the use cases, most of the popular OID cloud providers. So it's pretty much comprehensive, and it's probably one of the most valuable features in the enterprise edition. Uh, Auto introspection is another one. So if you have a running Auto server from you know 2011, you can connect COM to that Auto server, and you can sync with that Auto server. Role-based access control. So, as a company, you can decide. Okay, this team can only view APIs. This team can only edit APIs. This team can delete APIs. Without role-based access control, everybody that has access to admin API, they can delete APIs. They can throw down the cluster. They can do pretty much every damage. So, role-based access control allows you to to manage your team, and also you have admin logs, so you know what's what's happening. Right. Developer portal, obviously, you know one of the API management started in 2009 with three things, gateway, port, analytics. So it's one of the three foundational things. allows you to publish APIs, onboard developers, manage developers. You can customize on your portal. Uh, obviously, you support open API spec. How many of you use Swagger? So how many of you use RAML or Blueprint? Uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, open API, you know, Swagger changed to open API. So I think OpenAPI will be the standard. Um, Ramble and Blueprint will eventually phase out, uh, as, as this is becoming basically the department for API uh, the, the specs. Uh, now, it's a little bit unfortunate that, you know, as we go into 2020, you know, developers and humans, we still have to, to, still have to write a spec, uh, where the gateway has all the information needed, where you can actually help generate specs, right? So it's, I think, you know, eventually it will be an underlying uh, technology but we will interface with them directly. The gateway will run, we will auto generate those specs for you. But the developer portal is kind of like the first step to more developers publish documentations. It's not that customizable, so you can have a you know, custom CMS, you can do developers.yourcompanynate.com. So it's very good for edge, it's very good for partners, consumption is very good for public API consumption. It's also getting a, a use for internal, as you have a lot of internal APIs. Um, it's also very useful for internal developers. It's actually funny because we're going back to to, to, to an API marketplace, which was we built for five years, but for a general user. Uh, Bytals and analytics. So, Bytals is a terminology that we came inside the company and now we were so uh, distributed. It's really focused on, on the health of Kong itself. So, the cluster, the caching, how Kong is doing. So, it's pretty much specific for Kong. Uh, analytics is, you know, it's been this thing that uh, forever for seven years, it it's allows you to have business metrics on top of the API traffic. Now, a lot of folks now use a login system, right? Like Datadog, New Relic, Splunk, uh, what, what, uh, maybe Elasticsearch, ELK. Which one, which one is the one you like the most? Elasticsearch, right? Yeah, the, the old ELK stack. Yeah, Kibana and everything. So, there is API, logs API that you can you know, import those data into your favorite login system, and you can visualize those data from Kong into your login system. So this is like nice to have, but of course it's always a mix. In a way, you get very simple metrics from API analytics, but as you want, you know, tracing, uh, logging, you always suggest to just connect Kong and send your HTTP, TCP, UDP logs into your favorite login system. Because that's probably where a company really are standardized on internally. It's the best way to push data. PG Pizza. And assign yes. So th this is um, uh, another important thing: quota metering. So you can see, you know, what's the quota is happening, what's going on at the other at the, at the quota layer, and you can publish those information to API consumers so they know how much is left in terms of quota, right? So think about it like what it will become is more a business intelligence platform for the runs on top of Kong. This tool is built only in JavaScript in UGS. This is a web socket connection on the charts, so they're pretty fast, uh, almost in real time. I think they have five second, five second latency. You can you can, you can see you know API requests by consumers by API. You can see tracing, uh, 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 um, round trip latency, proxy latency. So uh, uh, also also caching. It's around ten or fifteen different metrics they can track on. Scalability. This is uh, the last part of the feature set. Uh, obviously, caching is very important to cache response at the edge. I'm pretty sure you, if you have multi data center deployment, you want a cache response. Backups, so if your cluster goes down, you can backups, uh, you can import and export the config. 
That's also very valuable if you use Kubernetes, so you can use the collaborative config and you can push all the declarative config into Kong and Kong will spin it up for you. And also, enterprise relimiting for uh, multi data center deployments where you can sync uh, relimiting across different regions. That's, that's very hard in this Google system to have a, a very a consistent relimiting across different regions, especially because there is network latency. So if you want to and really living in, in a London cluster, sync with Kong cluster in Virginia, there is a network latency over the, over the oceans of around 800 milliseconds. So the, you always have to consider those hash, and you need to keep the two clusters in sync. So the enterprise for living allows you to have this consistency if you go multi-region. If you have single region, probably the open source, the community really is really strong enough. And then uh, the last part package, some more feature, this is really humans power. We don't have support. So we don't have support. We have customer success engineers, which is way more expensive in the company. We invest way more. But the quality is much better because it's proactive. There is bi-weekly or bi-weekly meetings. There is not, it's not passive or you open a ticket, someone answer. Oh, how can I help you? It's really strategic. Uh, some of them report to the office of the CTO, like the solution architects. So it's a full package, which is very, very proactive, and customers love it. So it's more expensive, but it's a strategy that we decided to do on day one, to invest in, in, in success engineers, not in support, to, especially for the early days, right? Maybe, maybe in the future you can, you can segment different kind of support tiers, but in the early days, we should have very high quality in supporting infrastructure and any of your company be successful. We also have professional service. It's very small, I think it's uh, less than 5% of the business. We, we actually love to give professional service business to partners. Professional service is mainly uh, plugin development. So if you want to write custom plugins, you don't have time, you can call the partner, or you can call us, and we can write custom plugins for you to connect to legacy system. Uh, we, can, we now write those in, in, uh, in well, but uh, next year you can write also different programming languages like Java. But uh, the only use of professional service is truly writing custom plugins. All the other things, they have automatically included in the enterprise subscriptions. We have a coverage uh, all over the world, Singapore, in London, uh, in Tokyo, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco, and in Boston. And then, this is the last piece of how it works. So it's pretty simple. It's probably the most simple business model in the, in the market of APIs. It's not consumption-based. It's not consumption-based because it's very hard to predict if you get a request. Uh, it's not fair to charge for consumption when you're running the software on your own. This is not Kong Cloud, this is Kong on-prem. So you run on your own infrastructure. So you can run on as many nodes as you want, as many CPU as you want, uh, a limited request, unlimited APIs. It won't matter. The only unit of value that matters is admins. So how many people manage Kong Enterprise? Usually it's 5, 10, 20 seats a year. Usually it's the API gateway team or the API teams. It's about 5 or 10 people. And that's the subscription. And so it's connected to that. Those are the ones that can use enterprise features like Portal as an admin, not as a consumer. Consumer always unlimited. Are the ones that have access to our success engineers, to our Slack channel for real time supports. So it's very simple uh, and it's very customer friendly because you don't have to think about, oh, now I can run another machine, I need to pay. You know, 10 grand more, I need to I need to deploy in different region, I need to pay more, or I my API request, I only got a million requests per day, now I'm doing five million requests per day, I, it's Black Friday, so I didn't predict the spike. So in Microsoft architecture, it's very, very hard to predict spikes. And, and because of that, we decided to just focus on the people. At the end, it's all about the people. So the people that use the software are the most important thing. It's all flat, and there are two different support options, standard for, nine, for Monday, Friday, and Premier 24-7, uh, uh, down to 15 minutes uh, SLA uh, and global and global coverage. They all come with a, a solution architect included for strategic thinking, uh, not just tactical based uh, support. So the key thing is really predictability. That's why we decided to go with this with this model. So you can predict and you can budget. In a global 5,000, the leadership can always budget and easily without thinking always. Okay, how much is going to cost in six months or in nine months? This is for Kong uh, For Kong, next year we also we have Kong Cloud, which is managed cloud, so we manage also the, the ops for you. That is a different model, because then there is infrastructure in it, and then maybe consumption base makes sense. But for on prem, that's doesn't make sense. Any questions until now? So just when you talk about consistency, is there a data store inside? Yeah, so, that's a good question. Uh, 
Okay. So let's take this, this one, right? So those are called nodes, scaling horizontally. And this is the database that uh, it's related to com, where you store all the config. So like rate limiting, right? The database is either Postgres, SQL, or Cassandra. We use Postgres if you need to deploy COM with single data center. You just use COM with Postgres. Easy. If you go to multi data center deployments, then you use Cassandra. And so all the cluster can point to the same Cassandra cluster, but you can have different Cassandra. So it's, it's supported both Postgres and Cassandra. And for red limiting, we also have Redis. So you can choose one of those policies. So your data store is just configuration? Yeah. Oh, it's maybe? Yes. So why 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 is the why you mentioned about the consistency then? In uh, in here. Uh, yeah, if yeah. Consistency. yeah, for multi-region setups, that's why we use uh, Cassandra. Cassandra is famous for, for for consistency, right? We can scale Postgres on different data centers. Right? Because there, there's there's no need for multi-cluster deployment. So in this case, because it supports Cassandra and also Redis Sentinel, which is an availability mode of running Redis for having consistency. Well, you, you have a single data centers, multi data centers, half data center. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, you know, this is a very sophisticated uh, feature. I think you need to have two or three data centers. They all talk to each other. So that's when you want to have a more heavyweight uh, compete. But think about it. The, the need of a database eventually you will disappear as we only can go ahead into a declarative config. So when you push your Kubernetes, there is a config on, on GitHub where you just import export config and you drop into com and you can and you can set up com through declarative configurations. So I think eventually the, the need of a database it will go away over time. Um, Especially as we move into you know service mesh network, with the database is too heavy. But for now, it's the best way to run high available system is to use high available technology like Redis and Cassandra for storing the config. Oh, that's it. Thank you. So now you have two different threads. One is the open source, one is the enterprise. Yeah. Then what will be the future of like for them for the open, open source one? Yes. So we, uh, the company has around, uh, so we were 15 people last year. Mm -hmm. We're now approaching 70. So we, 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 we grew 5x, uh, mainly on enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. But of course, open source is the core, mm -hmm. is the foundation. So in, in the engineering team, half of the engineers work for enterprise and half of the engineers work for a community. So the roadmaps keeps growing both ways. Okay. For example, the next community version, the last community version we added load balancing, then okay. load balancing, server discovery, connected console or SVN record. The next uh, community version coming in December, we add uh, things like health checks, okay. active and passive. They're very important feature uh, that for example, you need to pay for, if you run Nginx, you need to buy Nginx Plus. To, to get health, health checks and to get the number of balancing. In Kong, you get it for free in the open source version. Okay. So we're gonna, every uh, two months, we always have a major community release yes. with a lot of interesting things. Um, I think enterprise eventually, you know, the generic team of enterprise will grow bigger as we have a lot, a lot of features, you know, security, machine learning, but the, the open source version is of course the core, right? Yeah. And um, so it's, for us, it's very important. We have open core, uh, we're born open source, you know, we, we, the community is very important. So if we know that you, you can't just, you know, grow enterprise and keep the community like this because eventually you don't, you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, support from, from them. That's correct.